the Business Simplicity Podcast, where leaders share their most successful strategies and the failures that inspired them, so business owners and managers can avoid the suffering and reap the benefits. With your host, your host Chris Parker. And welcome back to the Business Simplicity Podcast. This is Chris Parker, and I'm having a conversation with Mark Vanden Brom who is currently a, I think, technical engineer, engineering manager. Um, manager. However, I know him from the previous chapter of his life as a, as a trainer, an agile trainer an agile coach. And I, I'm trying to think, I think I've experienced his mastery of performance um, (laughs) three times. I can think of um, around a, a, a topic of agile for executives or agile for managers and Mark was kind enough uh, at that time through Xebia um, to um, really custom make and craft and, and, and sort of intervention type experience for different groups of executives and managers. And I love starting agile journeys that way because, um, well, it starts and sometimes can stop with leadership and engagement. And, and oftentimes it's bottom up, but I really try to balance that with the top down as well. So um Delighted to have you here, Mark. Can you just get us kicked off and, and share um, what is it that you do? What I do or what I did? Well, I was thinking about that as I asked it. So I, <laughs> and I decided to leave it open and say, what is it that you, I'll just leave it at do and I'll let you answer that as you feel. Yeah, let's, let's do. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm currently an engineering manager at Dash, uh, which is uh, 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 an IT yeah, company that's primarily working for young capital. And there I am uh, responsible for uh, two teams of awesome developers and try to make them even better than they currently are. And um, yeah, basically how I rolled into this was that I have been an agile consultant for about five years. And in that role, I always helped organizations um, becoming a better ver- version of themselves us- using all kinds of tools that re- were related to uh, agility. And uh, well, now instead of telling others what to do, I have to do it myself. So really built awesome teams and uh, loving it so far. Yeah. So that's what I do. And let me, let me nibble on that a little bit because cool. you told me a bit of the story when we were up in Stockholm, when you were delivering the, the last session that this company that you're now working for, I'm paraphrasing and feel free not to answer if you're not allowed, but decided not to go for the top engineer as a manager of these teams, but go for a sort of a human centric um, people manager that was also technically rare. I'm very curious of that because that's also a bit my profile. I mean, I'm a generalist human manager that manages tech. So I'm just curious, is this a trend in the in the market you're seeing, or is this something that they did on purpose, or what's what's the backstory of getting a agile human person to to manage engineers? Yeah, I, I don't know actually. Um, is it something I've seen before? I think so, but it's always, you know, it's, it's always one of those tough questions when it comes to agile ways of working like hey how are we going to support the growth of people who should be responsible for that and that's always like a hot potato and many people have many different opinions on on it like yeah well it's a self-organizing team and you shouldn't manage those and others say like well we'll create something like chapters where people with like-minded people can support one another and somebody will become the lead and well Dash just uh, chose to uh, create a pool of engineering managers that are going to take on that role on growth and and making sure that there's continuous improvement. And uh, and so far, it, it, it works really well. We've got a nice, diverse group of people that uh, that support the teams. And uh, yeah, I think I think this setup really works because um, we all have affinity or sometimes experience with the uh, the playing field that we're in. Uh, and I think that is important to be able to have a valuable conversation, but we're not that involved that, that we're like, hey, move aside, give me the keyboard, I'll fix it for you. Because like, like I tell my teams, you do not want me in your code. You know, that's the ultimate quality test in me in your code. Yeah, so, we, yeah. And we've all failed. So it's, yeah. um, no, it, 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 it's such a, a, thing to wrestle with, meaning, meaning if you're going down the agile and the scrum path and you've got a product owner who's bringing mm-hmm. in the work and you've got, and I've learned all this from you, so 
if I get it wrong, I blame you. No, if you've got a product <laughs> owner sort of bringing in the work and prioritizing, crafting the work, you've got a scrum master working on flow and, and you know, you've got the team that can pretty much do whatever it needs to do to, to get things delivered. And you might have some, some supportive stuff, like some architecture and some security and some shizzle running around. And, and then there's a question of the yeah, man management, the people growth stuff. And, and then that manager who's sitting there looking awkwardly like, well, what am I supposed to be doing? And so far, I've never found a perfect answer for that. And, and maybe there isn't a perfect answer because it's really I don't think, context. I don't think there is yeah. a perfect answer. You know, I know examples of companies that say like, hey, um, we're not going to do any management whatsoever. So it's completely self-organizing. I've, I've seen experiments like that mm. uh, flourish. You know, I know of companies that, that do that very well. At the same time, I've also seen companies, uh, yeah, going down a rabbit hole and and really fail awesomely with that, you know. So I think depending on the situation that you are, the kind of people that you have in your uh, in, in your uh, in your company, um, choose a model, make it work, and if it doesn't work, change it. You know, that's that's mm-hmm. the whole concept of agility in, in uh, uh, on that level as well. You know, try it, experiment with it. If it doesn't work, change it. Improve yeah. it continuously. Cool. So let me jump back to the script. And um, um, why do you do what you do? Meaning, meaning, what brought you to this path, and what keeps you here, and what, what energizes you about this type of work? Um, I've always been passionate about getting the most out of things in general. Um, you're you're so- a capitalist. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to have more money and make more money out of that. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. But no, so no. Um, but when it comes to people, you know, I, don't, I, I always like to see uh, my own experience also like a, a continuous journey, like improving myself uh, in every way possible, you know, improving my life, improving teams that I work with, but also helping others to grow continuously. Um, and, and, and I just get really energized by that. So seeing people become a better version of themselves, seeing teams become better versions of themselves, seeing organizations become better versions of themselves, it just, yeah, it gives me a lot of energy. And, 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 and what I love to do in that journey is to really keep it simple. So, you know, you, you, the, the, the name of your podcast really strikes me because I just love simplicity. You know, keeping stuff simple. Don't make it more difficult than it is. Just keep it plain. Keep it simple. Keep go on the journey. Try, experiment, learn, mm. and move on continuously. Yeah. I mean, again, let me nibble a bit of off, off off piste. Um, do you have any any insights in um, why things become more complicated or complex? Like like in, in your experience, because we all everyone talks about simplicity. Yeah, or productivity, and you know, which are different things, but oftentimes are are, are bundled together. Efficiency, um, yet it seems so elusive. So I'm curious, in in your experience, what do you see that are that are the drivers of complexity and and, and complication? I I would love to focus mainly on the human aspect of that. Uh, for me, usually complexity, uh, well. Uh, multiple ways of complexity, of course, but the, the thing that I lo- love to is, is in discussions or situations that are being discussed. And where complexity then arises is two things. First off, um, people not knowing all of the details. And second, not knowing that they don't know because people assume they know all the details and thereby start to, to start to explain to others why their view is the right view and not being aware of the fact that their view is only a limited view of reality. And, and all people and everybody in a room starts to talk about their view on reality and thereby you, you just come into a jumble of ideas and opinions and it just becomes a mess. And, and, and I always... Think of, I think it was a quote of Einstein that it, it's really easy to make something really difficult and complex, but it takes a really amount of, uh, a big amount of effort to bring it back to the core mm. and make it simple again. And, and that's what, what I 
truly believe. You know, you need to step out of that discussion and and get the the core essence and facilitate that discussion to make it simple, crisp, and clear again. And so I think it all has to do with human behavior and our own inability to understand that we do not hold the truth. Mm. Love it. I, I, okay, I'm going to plug uh, what, what I'm doing a little bit because the, the Simplicity Toolkit, where people can download that for free off, off of Boolean.com. Um, again, that is a, a, a 15 domain sort of business design framework. And the magic of that is if you have people on your team, that doesn't mean managers, but a group of humans, um, answer those questions in splendid isolation. And then you compare and contrast. And then, then you, there you can see the different perspectives. Because when I run that, I also I don't tell people how to answer the question. Just like I, when I asked you, what do you do? I was like, I'm just going to answer the question. Because people with their view of reality and their view of the facts will answer it in a certain way. And I think if you, if you try to drive the answer and script the answer too much up front, then you're going to have some conformity, but you're not going to actually get the, the, the value system behind it. So, um, so if anyone's using the simplicity scan from the toolkit, then um, I really like to do it. Like have each person answer uh, either all 15 or five at a time, and then have a dialogue around it and say, well, why did you answer it that way? That can't be right. Well, it probably is right, but just from a different perspective. Exactly. And that's that's the whole uh, whole idea, of course. You know, it's their perspective. And in their mind, that's the truth. And if you only limit yourself to your truth and then start to convince people, you know, you're not going to get mm-hmm. anywhere. So, um, um th- Pull, pulling back out of simplicity and, and going into um, in, into the uh, at least the, the the world I know for you best of, of this agile advising and coaching and transformation and training. Um, can you share with us something that that and the primer that I've given you because I have been leading the leading the 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 the, the witness a bit. Um, you know, for uh, if leadership or the executives or management is is really a you know must be an enabler for this type of working and and, and creating value through the system. Mm-hmm. Um, is there is there something that you can share which is which is particularly relevant and uh, for for an organization to you know to to get that value going, which is yeah. basically what agile is all about. Of course, yeah, uh, I'd love to 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 dive into that one. Um, you know, for me, one thing always stands out. Um, and um, it doesn't really matter if uh, uh, some introduction of agile in an organization is first off driven by management or leadership or that comes second. You know, what it always boils down to, nine out of ten times at least, uh, I don't have the absolute truth, uh, but that it always starts to focus on teams and individual teams. So first, let, let teams work in some work form of an agile way of working. So that can be Scrum, can be Kanban or any other of these methods, you know. Um, so the teams start to run and that starts to smoothen out and they start to improve and their, 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 their output, their outcomes dramatically improve. So once you gave them a project a year ago or a great idea, they would take like half a year and now in the current situation, they might take three months to, to complete it. So that looks like a 50% increase in productivity or effectiveness or whatever you, metric you would like to use. But the fun thing is, if you zoom out a little more, then you see a completely different picture because we usually forget about that whole flow of that whole process that goes before it reaches the team that has to execute the idea. Because somewhere, somebody had a brilliant idea on, hey, we should do this or we should do that and we should do, and let, let's make a small business case. Let's go into the market and, and find out if it's actually a good idea. Let's make a proof of concept. You know, all of those individual steps before it actually reaches the team for execution. So let's take that the same example, but then look at the whole time frame. And then you see, like, for example, that it would be taking three years from the, cons- the initial idea still going live towards your clients. And you've just improved that that flow by three months. So instead of three years, it now takes you two years and nine months. So woohoo, brilliant improvement. And that's a pity because, you know, even though you have the feeling that you have achieved a great performance increase with your 
teams that actually do the work, the whole process that goes before that basically eliminates the vast majority of that value. So it is really worth diving into that part of that whole process as well with the same mindset, with the same philosophy. And there I've learned uh, a lot from, uh, from the, the Kanban method um, to, to, to optimize that because what you would want to do is also limit the amount of work that goes via goes through that flow because by doing many things simultaneously, I don't have to tell you or probably any of the listeners, doing all kinds of stuff simultaneously really slows down that process. So it boils down to you need to make choices in that process as well. So out of the 20 or 30 or 40 ideas that you have, start with a few. Run that process that you usually do, um, but do it really fast. So you really quickly get it to the teams and get them to execute because then you really start to shrink and then you become really agile. Then you really become flexible. Um, and, and, that, and that's for me is always, uh, always fascinating. Can, can you um, give us a quick primer on Kanban? Um, Kanban. So just assume people don't know what it is. I, you know, I, I, can, I can give my perception, but I'm sure you'll do it much better. <laughs> Well, uh, the Kanban method is um, basically, I, I always probably uh, error, errorously um, explain it as a lot of the principles of, of, of lean about uh, optimization used for knowledge work. So, so it, it revolves about around a couple of uh, practices, a couple of principles, and, and one, one of the most valuable ones uh, I always see is use visualization, limit the amount of work in, pro, uh, in, in, in um, progress, have clear policies on when stuff goes through or when it stops, uh, relentless improvement. So those are really a couple of those, of those practices that you can, use, you can apply on any process through which knowledge work goes. Mm. And having an idea and getting it ready for development is a lot of knowledge work because you, you, you usually do that with your heads. Yes, of course, there might be some labor in, in, in there with, with, with creating a proof of concept, for example. But the vast majority is people thinking about a idea and how to create a product out of that. Mm. So um, that's where Kanban comes from. For me. So, and, and for people, if, if anyone's used Trello or a tool like that, and if you've seen something like a to do, doing, and done list, then that's yeah. a bit inspired by Kanban and then limit work in progress. It is, is a, it's a Kanban yeah. board. Yeah. Kanban board. And if limit work in progress is, is that doing part, should be minimal. <laughs> yes. So, yes. And, and then don't put another thing in the doing until you got something that's done. Exactly and, uh, that. And, and, and the discipline that's required for that. So, Asking a, a question on that because I'm going to get into the how, but I was recently talking to a friend who's doing some advisory work um, with a company who who has a whole executive decision process. Meaning, if if someone wants a business analyst um, or a product owner for an individual product, so that oddly they're not assigned to product, um, they had to put it into the help desk and get allocated, and management had to decide which is most priority and then they got allocated the work and then they did the work and then they had to do work and they had to come back and do a change advisory board. Um, I'm guessing you had something in mind rather than this siloed top-down governed process, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and so I'm asking the question because I'm going to have him listen to it and see, okay, well, if you wanted to create end-to-end -end value while applying Kanban principles, how would you see that in real life? How would, I, how would I see that? You know, it can, like I said, you can apply it on every, any level of a knowledge process. But the thing I'm focusing on right now in our current discussion is really that process where you have the big ideas, the strategic ideas on what to do in, in, from end to end within your organization. And usually there is a process in place. Like it or not, it, it usually, from the outside, it looks like a messy thing. But if you look a little deeper, there's always some kind of logic behind it. So you have an idea, you have a little brainstorm in your executive board, for example, somebody does a small business case on it, somebody does a proof of concept, you do some marketing, there's always some kind of a flow. 
And what you can do really easily is just make a visualization out of that. Just like, just make the columns, just visualize that process. And then what you can do is let's take all of the current initiatives, put them on a sticky note physically or virtually and stick them on that process and see what, what you currently have in that humongous pipeline. Well, I see you, you, you're thinking about that. I'm, 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 what what I, would your slide look like? Well, there's just, I imagine there's a lot of stuff that executives wouldn't want to be visual because they don't want it to be killed. So I guess there'll have to be some trust and transparency and some, some collective check-in here. Yeah, um, and there you, come, there you actually come to the last point that I would like to stress, but let's, let's take, take it uh, on, on, uh, at this time. There is a lot of ego and self-interest which stands in the way of doing this because you are absolutely right. Because the things you will probably write on that board or make visible are your darlings, are the things you truly believe in. And let's dive, may, maybe even, I'm just connecting some dots, like our previous discussion before we dived into this topic about my truth versus your truth. You know, in my world, it's a great idea. In your world, it might be an awful idea. But in, mm. the, gra in, in the mind of the greater good, in the, in, the, 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 in the philosophy of the whole company, there can only be one truth. So it's either a good idea or it's not. And the fact that it supports your personal KPIs doesn't make it a good idea. So either you might have a personal interest of getting it done, you might deeply believe in it, that, thereby you want to get it done. But as an executive team, you have the responsibility to use the time of all of the people in your organization as effective and efficient as possible. And you can't tear people apart. So what I usually saw happening when I was doing a process like this. So we, we drew the process, we had the stickies on there, and then we, we had a discussion on, okay, what are basically the demarcation lines? When does something go, uh, go on in this process? Which is a really fun discussion to have. And then come to the point like, hey, how much do we want to have in this process? And then that's where the, the tough work starts because then you have to come up with some kind of a measure if something is a good idea or not. Should it stay in or should it move out? Mm. Because as long as you don't start to move stuff out, because I've never seen that it was nicely balanced, it's always way too much of, of, of the ideas in there, you have to chuck stuff out. And if you don't, it will all go down and you, you'll clog the system. You will clog the whole process of, of getting work ready for your teams. And what you will end up with, with is that your idea that you, you valued so much is going to get delayed and more delayed. And it's going to be like halfway done by the time you wanted to have it done. So let's face reality. You love the idea. Nobody else does. So the chances of get it getting ready in time is almost near to nothing. So why would you continue to work on it? Why would you spend time, energy, uh, human resources or other, you know, why would you do it? Let's, let's create focus. And if it then becomes apparent mm. that your idea is still really good and really valuable, it'll go through anyway. It'll, it'll, mm. it'll come to the surface again. I think you can also add, solve other problems. I'm, I'm remembering back to a, a previous chapter in my career with pretty good knowledge when with an insurance company, we created a, 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 a we call it more of a funnel rather than a Kanban, but same thing, stages. It's a funnel. Um, and, and. Uh, what it was around is innovating, innovating wisely with data, and they were they wanted to push the limit on on say AI driven, ML driven decision making around actuarial services, so risk assessments. Mm -hmm. um, but insurance has to do with humans, people, and mm -hmm. privacy, mm -hmm. and and what we, we ended up doing is having um, uh, these gates very clear on when does um, compliance need to be involved. When does legal need to be involved? When does brand need to be involved? You know, all these checklists. And what we're trying to do is create as much freedom at the beginning of the process for people to think about stuff and do little micro experiments. But, but for example, they were unable, they were not allowed to use actual human data at all. Yeah. It had to be artificial manufactured data Un until they got to a certain threshold that to say, okay, then we need to check in and then we have to have a conversation. 
you know, is this, is this, is this wise? Is this damaging of the brand? Is this legal? Is this, is this, you know, all, all of these other checklists. And then, then they could, then they were given a little bit more freedom to do a little bit more experimentation and get it to a point. And then, um, no, I, I, yeah, I can imagine it. We, ne- we never looked at the volume of work because uh, it was, it was more, it was more, we were trying to get volume of work in because basically mm-hmm. legal and compliance was saying no to everything. You can't even think about that. We're like, well, wait, why not? It might be a bad idea, but at least we can go through a, a process. Yeah. So, I, so I, and, I, yeah. And I, and I agree with you. You know, it, it is a funnel. You know, like typically these kind of things are a funnel because um, up until the point that your teams actually start to work on it, it's still an idea. Mm-hmm. So the limits that you put on that system, you, wa- you would always want to have more ideas than you would like to have in some kind of a business case and even less in a proof of concept. So the work in progress limits should become smaller and smaller and smaller. And there should always be a, a minimum as well because you want to have a healthy amount of stuff going in there continuously. Mm-hmm. So that's the whole idea behind it. So the example that you've just given, if you would have added the the numbers game, I think it would have been a pretty smooth system because then you would have had an alert mm-hmm. when there was too little in there and you would have had an alert when there were like, hey, we're overloading. We are like putting too much uh, in there right now, thereby clogging up the system. Yeah, the reason I was laughing a bit ago was um, a funnel implies things are rejected. <laughs> yes, they should be. And- should be. And not every executive team I've been on are the members of that team willing to reject their own darling. Um, and so sometimes the funnel is very sort of two parallel lines and everyone just fighting to stuff their, their noise through the system. And, uh, yeah. But again, this is, comes in where the discipline comes in. And, and I think the, discipline in- the appreciation of what is value and, and the fact that we can't overwhelm the people with just endless piles of, of noise. Yeah. It, it is not making these choices and, and continuous multitasking and having too many things going in at the same time, for me, is deeply disrespectful for the people actually doing the work. And, and, and that's yeah. why when you were asking me, like, what is the topic that you truly value, what you truly feel deeply about, this is that, because... Always we look at the teams doing the work as they are doing a bad job. No, no, no. uh, Too often I've seen that this is the problem, that management, leadership, executives, whatever you want to call it, the people in charge of of managing the the input of new work, they Mm. fail to make choices. They fail to create focus. They fail to have a healthy inflow of new stuff and thereby asking teams to continuously multitask, continuously switch from uh, project A to project B, from task A to task B to task Z. You know, that is deeply troubling. That is deeply disrespectful. Mm-hmm. And that will, that will create people to walk away because they're, well, they feel they can't finish anything because before they have something halfway finished, some executive will come in and they say like, hey, uh, I understand that you thought this was an important project, but actually my project is more valuable, more important. So please work on that. And if you continue to do that, you'll you'll just kill the whole organization. Mm. And then you've got a nice agile machine. You've got a nice agile development team, or uh, but the stuff that comes in is rubbish. I think that last 60 seconds, um every executive literally in the world should listen to I meaning and you know the, the, i think this is the, the the premise of why i just just was delighted to have you in a respectful way share that message with um with executive teams you know before they're starting on 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 the their agile journeys and it's um obviously a one day training doesn't doesn't work but it, that is just um blaming the teams for failing to achieve within a, an unstructured and overwhelming context, I think is just so unfair. Yeah. Um, so have you seen um, maybe in your own experience or otherwise a, 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 an incredible transformation around this, meaning go from, from, from a completely clogged system to uh, some sort of enlightenment throughout the organization to, to achieving a, 
a significantly better state of, of flow and predictability? Oof, tough question. Tough, tough question. And the fact that I have to think about it so hard means that I haven't seen it often enough. No. No, I have seen improvement, definitely. And I, I've... Yes, I have seen signs of it, but there, there, there I have to, to come back to the, the point I was making about the egos and the self-interest. What you saw that they were getting stuff out of the funnel and removing it. And like a couple of weeks later, you slowly but gradually saw stuff being moved in again because their own interests were at stake. So sadly, I, I don't have brilliant examples. No, that's a pity. Well, one example I come up, but it wasn't it wasn't a transformation. Um, and you and you had a bit of part there, which was with, with power peers. Um, but that was a, a fundamental shock to the system. I Meaning we were able to set up a separate organization in order to refactor this technology for resale. Um, and and through that shock to the system, we were able to bring in new mindsets. Was mm -hmm. basically the thing. Um, but pretty much everywhere else I've been. Um, you know, with the tone at the top, as long as the mindset of, of management is still, you know, drive your darlings and, and unstructured, undisciplined process, yeah. that the benefits are, 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 are pretty limited. Yeah. And then that's why we have agile coaches around and that's why we give training and, you know, just an iterative, slowly growing until at, at some point you hope there's an aha. Um, and I think in variable there is at some time. And, 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 and in all fairness, you know, what I do see with my current environment is that uh, the role that I currently play is that I have a nice dialogue with the product managers that are uh, involved with my teams. And I really can help them to create a little bit of focus. So I just bluntly support the teams in, in refusing multitasking. So it's like one project, maybe two things if we the team feels that they can, but I really want to see that focus. And if we don't see that focus, we'll change it. So yeah, yeah, yeah just just well, just don't, well, don't, don't want to think that uh, that my current job is a <laughs> no. It's a human thing. It's I'm laughing because um, you know some of the people you met in Sweden. Um, 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 well, what I heard recently is is for their sprint. They and again, it's delightful that they're doing this, but but that they're in order to try to achieve this flow, they're changing the definitions of, of sprint durations. And at one point, they had forty five points in the scope, and they achieved one. Um, and I think it's great. Meaning, meaning the fact that they're having that conversation, because you know, it wasn't me sticking my nose in it. It was like th they were becoming aware that maybe the way we're trying to solve the problems is counterproductive. And, and maybe, and then, you know, and then what do we do? You know, cause clearly there's an overwhelm of stuff coming in. Okay. Can we solve it on that end or, you know, and, and, and have that dialogue of, of, Hey, this isn't working. This doesn't feel good. What can we, what, what small thing can we improve next time? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I think uh, I've seen uh, too many examples and one that still see clearly in front of me, uh, a team that were, was doing like a quarterly planning and they um, had like 30 odd items that they wanted to do in the previous quarter and they've they achieved like six or seven of them so what did they do for the next one well all the, th the stuff that was not ready from the previous one plus an additional 40 so now there were 70 items and i was like why are you unable to make a choice yeah, yeah we have promised this to our customers we have promised this so we have to start it and, and saying, yes, we're working on it is easier to say than, sorry, we're not going to mm. do this this time around. Well, there's a, there's a phrase that came up in, in, in the Destiny executive team and, and probably had something to do with your in, in intervention. But um, uh, we, have, we, have, we use a derivation of, of OKRs. Um, mm -hmm. We call them you know, must-win battles. And it is kind of a, a thing in the market, sort of a simplified OKR. And what, what it's evolved is a counter you know, anti-pattern of, of um, must stop nows. Um, oh, brilliant. And I, yeah, it's not stuck yet because we don't have a formal must stop now register, but it keeps coming up again and again. Meaning like if this is a must win battle, then what must we stop? 
And, and that, the fact that it's becoming more conscious is already just so delicious. You know, yeah. okay, maybe it's awesome. not as robust and as formal as the must-win battle structure, but there, there is this realization that decisions need to be taken, and uh, uh, that feels good. So, um, Mark, this is awesome. I, I, I shared with you before we started recording how, how tremendously disappointed I am for the rest of humanity that Dash has you pulled into their organization, um, and I'm delighted for them um, and delighted to have you on for this because every time we... Uh, engage. I, I learn and I'm inspired. I hope the audience was as well. If people would like to get in touch uh, with Mark, um, get him on LinkedIn, uh, Mark Van der Brom. Um, I'll put the uh, link in the show notes. Um, it's yeah. If, if you can, if you can get his get his time, and he's, I think, I think you're quite open to talking to people. You can yeah. feel free to have a, have a coffee and um, love it. So, Mark, thanks so much for joining. This was uh, outstanding. Thank you very much for having me, and I uh, loved uh, our conversation. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Download the Simplicity Toolkit from ebrilliant.com to discover the power of the Simplicity Scan and Sprint. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite player.